Shalja, I'm just getting into the webinar. Can I call you? Good evening, everyone. We welcome you all to Ortho TV. This webinar is called Virtual Arthroplasty. It is going to be on the knee and the hip. This webinar is supported by MacLeod's Gen Care, the makers of BioD3 Max and Enzo Mac. So I would request Mr. Rajiv Tripathi from MacLeod's Gen Care to say a few words before we hand over to our moderator, Dr. K.D. Tripathi. Hi, uh, good evening, sirs. Good evening to all of you. Uh, myself, Rajiv, with my senior colleague, Mr. Milind Thomre, are there to welcome you all on behalf of MacLeod's. Sir, thanking you very much for giving us uh, this privilege of being there with you, sharing this platform with you. Not speaking much of it, thank you very much for there with us for 33 long years and making us a leader in orthopedic fraternity. So thanks a lot. I hand over the session to Dr. K.D. Tripathi to take the session further. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rajiv, and thank you, Dr. Bijlani. I think uh, this is a wonderful evening to provide us the Ortho TV platform. Uh, on behalf of Allahabad Orthopedic Society, with my colleagues, President Dr. Uh, H.V. Chandra and Secretary Dr. Manisi Bansal, I welcome you all, all the, all the audiences and our faculty and our chairpersons. First of all, I welcome Dr. Rajiv Nayak, the former president of uh, Indian Orthopedic Association in 2011. Uh, he has uh, given permission to chair the uh, session. And then uh, Dr. Ashok Rajgopal, who is the group chairman of uh, uh, musculoskeletal science department and orthopedics uh, in the Medanta Medi City. He is the role model for the any knee surgeon uh, all over the uh, India, even the on the global platform. He is the role model for knee surgeons. Dr. Uh, Suri Narayan, known as the Professor Suri, he is the joint director of the Asian Institute of uh, Joint Replacement at Chennai. He is again the uh, internationally renowned surgeon and uh, Dr. Amit Rastogi, my friend, who is a professor and uh, joint replacement surgeon at the Varanasi IMS Bichu. And uh, along with uh, all you, I just uh, request my secretary, Dr. Manishi Bansal, to welcome all the faculty and uh, other students. Dr. Manishi. Thank you, Thank you sir. Uh, so it's a great privilege for me and Malhabad Orthopedic Society to welcome you all on this virtual orthoplasty meet. I welcome from the land of Three Rivers, Priyagraj, Professor Rajiv Naik, Dr. Padmashri and BC Rai Awardee, Dr. Ashok Rajgopal sir, Professor Sunar and Pichai sir, and our secretary, uh, IOA, IOA president, and uh, recently elected IOS secretary, Dr. Naveen Thakkar sir, Dr. Amit Rastogi sir, our very known and uh, just uh, we call it, we don't feel him as an outsider, we feel him as a name and uh, our own team member. And of course, Dr., uh, at the last, uh, Mr. Neeraj Jilani, Dr. Neeraj Jilani, who has given us opportunity of the ortho TV, the wonder ortho TV, IO, uh, with this meet, we will learn a lot of from the stand of the Suri regarding the orthoplasty and the younger generation will definitely be benefited by uh, their wisdom. So I welcome you all, sir. Now I welcome Dr. Rajiv Naik, sir, to start the first session and introduce Professor Dr. Ashok Rajgopal, sir. Dr. Rajiv Naik, sir, he is the head of the department of, uh, he was the head of the department of B.R. Ambedkar Medical College, Bangalore, and uh, he was the former president uh, of uh, Indian Orthopedic Association, Karnataka Orthopedic Association, and many more associations. I think uh, there is a long list, and you all know because he has been our leader for so many years. Dr. Rajiv Nayak, sir, please introduce Dr. Rajgopal and take the uh, uh, chair, chair the session, the new session. Uh, uh, <clears throat> thanks, uh, Dr. Tripathi. It, uh, it has been uh, to accept your invitation. I'm honored to be here. And to introduce Ashok Rajgopal, uh, everyone knows about him, so it is not very difficult for me. But all the same, I have to read because of uh, the chronological order that I wouldn't be remembering. Ashok Rajgopal at the moment is the global chairman of the Medanta Institute of Orthopedics at Gurgaon. 
He heads the musculoskeletal uh, department there. He has over 30 years of experience. He was appointed uh, as honorary orthopedic surgeon to the president of India. Uh, Mr. K. R. Narayan in 1997. Dr. Raj Gopal uh, was conferred the Padma Shri, the fourth highest uh, honor of the government of India in recognition of the immense contribution to the field of orthopedics and joint replacement. He was also awarded the BC Roy Award in the year 2014 <laughs> to recognize the best talents in encouraging the development of speciality in different branches of medicine. Dr. Raj Gopal uh, in 2014 was inducted into the Armed Forces, Armed Forces Medical College Hall of Fame. He's uh, alma mater. This induction was in recognition of the services to the mankind and the field of orthopedics. He is the founder, secretary, and past president of the Asia Pacific Arthroplasty Society, the APAS. And, uh, and, the past, uh, and the past president of the Indian Arthroscopic Society and the Indian Hip and Knee Society. He was, he was awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award of the APAS in the year 2012. In recognition of the extraordinary services in the field of orthopedic surgery, he was awarded honorary fellowship of the Royal College of Surgeons of Orthopedics, Edinburgh in 2000, 2010. He was awarded the Bharat, uh, Bharat Shiromani Award in the year 2008 and 2009 for the professional excellence in the field of orthopedics. He was awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award for Alumni Association of the Sancheti Institute, Pune in 2015. He successfully treated several international sports level sports personalities for a variety of knee related disorders. These, these players have gone on to win laurels for the country after their surgery. Um, I, I could go on and on and on, but uh, this probably is the most brief introduction that I could uh, give of Dr. Ashok Raj Gopal. Sir, the field is all yours. Um, please go on. And uh, uh, I hope all the youngsters listening to you will, will immensely benefit from your experiences. More, uh, we would be grateful if you could highlight the errors that somebody can commit so that he will not commit them in, in future times. So kindly concentrate your talk to minimize the errors in surgery rather than, uh, you know, so that would be much, uh, much expected from you, sir. And please take the mic over. Uh, my very, very dear friend, Suri, uh, for this uh, opportunity to share this platform. And, um, I'm going to talk to you about the uh, 10 steps to get your knees right. Um, and that will be followed by what, what is recent in, uh, in knee arthroplasty. So, so these are the 10 commandments, as it were, uh, for doing total knee arthroplasty. And uh, Dr. Nayak has very aptly sort of um, said the uh, sentiments of this talk on trying to do this knee well and to do it in a safe manner. So what really are our issues? Uh, in terms of when you start to embark on doing knee replacements, you have to pick out your patients in terms of indications, the right patient selection, the right implant selection. You need to look at your surgical technique and finally the rehabilitation issues. Uh, the, in terms of indication, it may seem the most obvious thing to do, but oftentimes uh, knees are replaced because of a pathology that ac actually exists in either the hip or the spine and the, the patient does not get better. We have seen patients who have actually had revision knee surgeries uh, somehow missing out the fact that the primary pathology existed in the hip or the knee. Similarly, vascular in the abdomen and the pelvic may again 
uh, area can cause uh, referred pains and need to be excluded. And I cannot overemphasize the uh, importance of clinical examination of uh, the lower limb and the back before recommending total knee arthroplasty. Now, right from the beginning, there are certain given criteria. There are, you can look at a patient and there are some warning signs that should sort of raise red flag. Patients who have psychological issues, people who are depressed, people who are on drugs, people who do not have family supports, who are uh, re resistant to following instructions. And the most important, the most important thing, and I cannot overemphasize this, those patients who have exceedingly high and unrealistic expectations, a patient who's been on a wheelchair, a severely deformed knees wanting to squat on the floor after surgery is going to give you trouble as long as you and he both uh, coexist on this planet. <clears throat> In terms of uh, preoperative uh, planning, you, the key to success is, first of all, you must uh, have the option of a good inventory. You need to decide on what your, what your options are. And even if you have a preference on a particular side, particularly in, in severe deformed knees, uh, have different varieties of implants, different sizes, inserts, polyethylenes, various forms of constraint. And again, when you're talking about severe deformities, always have your fallback options because it's not uncommon sometimes when you do doing replacement surgeries for the situation to get out of hand. And if you don't have fallback options, then it becomes a very embarrassing situation to try and get out of that, uh, of that clinical uh, situation. Uh, Preoperative planning is extremely important. You can do this either by templating it. We don't actually routinely template it because of the fact that most of the x-rays today are digital, but it helps to have a standard x if you're having standard x-rays to, to, to uh, template this because it gives you a pretty accurate index of the sizes. Always look at full length films, particularly in our part of the world because you can have extra articular deformities. You can have bowing of the femur or the tibia. Uh, subclinical or old osteomalacia rickets can cause extraarticular uh, uh, deformities. And if they are present, then you obviously need to factor in the needs for your stems, wedges, and possibly bone grafts. Uh, the x-rays of this nature are, are, are good to go by, but this patient, in fact, also had a associated extraarticular deformity in the distal tibia and was missed and ended up with a revision surgery very early on because the alignment was faulty. Uh, these are some of the templates that are available. As I said, I routinely do not use templates, but we use full length x-rays, weight bearing x-rays for all of our patients that includes the hip, the knee and the ankle. So there are really <clears throat> only 10 key points that you need to look at for, for success. Um, the first is exposure, and I cannot uh, overemphasize. I mean, I've been doing knees for 35 years, so I've pretty much seen it all. Uh, when we went from the phase of doing proper knee replacements um, with almost 14 inch long incisions when we started, uh, when I started in 1986, 87, to the 2000s where we were trying to do knees through a three inch incision that was called the mini uh, MIS surgery. That, that was the biggest disaster that happened in, uh, in, in the entire history of total knee replacements. You need to make a standard cut on a distal femur in five degrees of valgus. Now, this is obviously not going to be sacrosanct in every knee. In certain uh, valgus knees, for instance, you would reduce the valgus by about uh, two degrees, go down to three, three degrees of distal valgus. For me, the tibia is the key ingredient of all successful knee replacements. I believe in the philosophy of the mechanical alignment. There are various other alignments, the constitutional, the kinematic alignment, the anatomical alignment. Uh, we believe in cutting the tibia at right angles and uh, we use about a seven degrees of posterior slope again, primarily because I am a, I am a CR surgeon. And uh, more importantly, you reproduce the posterior tibial slope of the native tibia. You have to make sure that your rotation, both on the femoral side and the tibial side is correct. And we'll talk about that as we go on. You need to balance your flexion and extension gap. Uh, and I cannot overemphasize this. I had the privilege of uh, spending time with uh, one of the greats of uh, knee surgery, John Insull. And this was the one 
take away message balance reflection and extension gaps you'll have a good stable knee you do not want to overstuff the, the joint because that causes pain limitation of movements loosening and arthrofibrosis uh most of us in, in the audience i'm sure are cement users and uh, if you are doing cementation you make sure that there is a proper uh, uh, irrigation you want an absolutely dry field uh, for almost 11 12 out of my 30 odd years i've been a uncemented uh, uh, implant uh, user and in those cases again the bed has got to be absolutely pristine there is some debate on the type of cement that you should use. Uh, the recent consensus uh, in 2018 when uh, Javed Parvizia's group uh, has recommended antibiotic um, cement, but I must confess that this is optional. We routinely do not use antibiotic cement. We use it only in immune compromised patients, patients on steroids, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, or uh, patients who have undergone a organ transplant. Uh, again, the choice of uh, suction train is debatable. If it's a big, large obese patients, we use it for relatively slimmer patients, we do not. You want to encourage very early therapy. We make our patients stand up and walk within four hours of the surgery. And the critical <laughs> issue here is treat your complications early. Do not wait for it to get full blown. If there's a, pa a patient who has a leaking wound that does not settle down within 48 to 72 hours, step in and do something about it. So the long-term success really depends on these four issues. You need to get your alignment right and you can have various uh, philosophies that you subscribe to. I subscribe to the mechanical, which is 90 degrees uh, of the tibia and three to five degrees of distal valgus. You need to do your bone cuts appropriately. In, our, in my situation, as I just explained, you need to balance your soft tissues and you need to get the rotation. And all these four, alignment and rotation, are the two, uh, the first and the fourth, are the two most important ingredients for getting your knee right. Um, and just to give you an example, this is, these are two x-rays, both the preoperative and the post-op. And if you see the, the, the screen to your left, where it says pre-op, you can see that the femoral component looks absolutely pristine, but the uh, tibial component looks skewed. Uh, one uh, edge of the tibial component is longer than the other. This tells you that this is malrotated. And the exact opposite has happened on the, on the right side, where the tibia looks good, but you can actually see the femoral condyle. So this again tells you that this is an internally rotated femur. So this is uh, one of the slides that uh, has gone global. Restore the mechanical axis, and this happens when the center of the hip, knee, and ankle are in line, and John Insull alluded to this in 1984. And you want to avoid various at all costs. Today, this may be a very contentious subject, particularly with the kinematic alignment. A lot of his followers uh, who do caliper alignment and uh, use the, the uh, three degrees of various. Uh, there's been a huge debate on this. I debated this at the CCGR that just concluded in uh, May. Um, but it's clear that 67% of all knees that are in various will fail. Um, and uh, interestingly, 20% of uh, neutrals will fail. So it's not only your, uh, your alignment that gives you good uh, survivorship. So this is the principle. Again, this is a slide that uh, has gone global. This is John Insall's slide. Rectangular claps, uh, both flexion and extension with symmetrical soft tissue tension. That's what you start off with and that's what you end with. And the basic principle is that distal femur influences only extension gaps. The posterior femur influences only the flexion gap and the proximal tibia influences both the flexion and your extension gaps. Um, now, what are the other factors? Does um, retaining or substituting cruciates, does, do they influence outcomes? Does cemented or cementless influence longevity? Fixed or mobile bearing? And does etiology, rheumatoids or uh, osteoarthritis, does age influence the outcome? These are the burning questions that we're all going to get uh, uh, asked. And the answer to the, just to go back, the answer to each one of these is none of these factors matter. You, CRs and PSs do well, cemented, cementless do well, fixed and mobiles do well, the rheumatoids and osteos do well, and age again is not a contraindication to surgery. My youngest patient was 16 when I implanted, she's now almost 28 years and still doing well. 
So how do you achieve the ideal landmark, uh, ideal alignment, use anatomical landmarks, which is what I use. There are alternate options that have been uh, introduced and uh, some are present, some have fallen by the wayside, navigation, PSI, and there's really no, uh, if you look at the uh, literature, no clear advantage of TK done uh, with navigational control compared to conventional and uh, from a, a 94% uh, usage at one point, a lot of centers, almost virtually all the centers were using navigation. And today, the incidence of navigators is down to 3%. The latest kid on the block is robotics, um, uh, awaits the test of time. We'd be interested to see whether this goes the way of the navigation and the PSI. Currently, the costs are a prohibitive issue, and we have some experience, and we'll very briefly talk about it. In terms of surgical technique, you need to do your ligament releases, which is we as uh, CR surgeons, I do this as a part of my exposure. We then do our bony cuts and then we do our final ligament releases. In terms of rotation, there are four uh, landmarks and what I would urge people to do is to use at least two of them. So I typically use the trans axis and the AP axis. I do not use the posterior condyles primarily because in severe deformities, there is overgrowth or uh, hypoplasty of the posterior condyles in various and valgus knees. And since we do the femur first, we do not use the transtibial axis, but that's an available option. Um, in terms of surgical techniques, rotation is based on landmarks and on the tibial side. Again, you have the option of using the extramedial guide, which most of us use. Uh, you can use the middle third of the tibial tubercle. And if you're using the lower end of your extramedial guide, a small tip, instead of using the space between the second and third metatarsal, align it to the tibialis anterior tendon, which you can always feel, and you'll get your alignment absolutely perfect. And that's really what we're trying to show over here. Uh, remove all your osteophytes in a various knee on the middle side. Uh, re uh, reconstitute the posterior recess, both in flexion and extension. And still is a debatable subject. Yeah. We retain it, but if you choose to take it down, that's really no no real issues. So you do again the you do a surgical release, you do a sequential release, uh, capsular ligaments, the semimembranosis, the superficial MCL is the last to be done. And if you're doing a PCL uh, resection, of course, you can do it at any stage. And lessons of awareness is again a, a late release. On the valgus side, again, the issue and importance is sequential lateral retinaculum, ITP, the uh, uh, lateral ligament, the postural lateral capsule. Very severe deformities, the lateral plastocranius, the PCL, and the popliteus. And uh, when we are looking at a flexion contracture, you release the capsule, you post the osteophytes, recreate the recess, resect your distal femur in an additional two millimeters, and either recess or resect your PCL. Uh, uh, the role of the posterior osteophyte cannot be um, overemphasized. You want to release that little bump of bone because that will release your flexion contracture. Uh, again, recreating a recess, uh, the posterior recess. And this goes a long way when you're trying to correct a severe flexion contracture. So what really is acceptable? At the end of your trial procedures, you want to have the medial side snug, which means one to two millimeters of opening, two to three millimeters of lateral opening, which is really physiological. All our knees do that. And if you are a PCL retainer like I am, your femur should articulate the, medial th the middle third of the tibia which in various systems, there are landmarks and uh, lines which you can align that tells you that you have a good articulation. Uh, again, in the context of the PCL retention, if you have the polo sign, the, the uh, pull out, lift off uh, sign that should be negative, uh, that indicates your PCL is tight and there are various ways to address that. Um, that indicates your flexion gap is tight. You can increase the slope or you can recess the PCL. We won't go into that. Uh, or you can, of course, sacrifice the PCL. And now you have the options of the congruent designs where you do not need to take the box cut. Uh, you do not want to overstuff the, uh, the, the compartments or uh, avoid oversizing the femur or under resecting the petala. And when you are between sizes, opt for the smaller size. If you are a CR surgeon or upsize, if you are a PS surgeon, uh, if you are resurfacing the petala, make sure that your pre-op and post-op uh, thickness remains the same. If you're not choosing to resurface the uh, petala, make sure your femoral implant has a very good, friendly petalar, uh, petalar or trochlear notch. Uh, in terms of rehab, and this has been the real boon of uh, recent advances, post-managing post-operative pain, 
There are various ways to do it. We use periarticular in injections. We use the adductor canal block. There are other people who use the quad block or the femoral canal block uh, with catheters, without catheters. The important thing to, is to understand that a patient who is in pain will not mobilize. So you want to make sure that within four to six hours, the patient is up on his feet walking and that boosts their confidence. And we've uh, been able to show that these patients do much better than patients who are apprehensive of pain. So in summary, a successful outcome depends on a marriage between a very cooperative patient, a well uh, selected patient, well conducted surgery and excellent rehabilitation pro protocol uh, with ex uh, realistic expectations from the patient. Um, again, in terms of complications, if you do happen to see them, do not procrastinate, uh, ensure primary wound healing. Uh, if a wound discharges, treat that aggressively. The, uh, we uh, live with the philosophy that there is no such thing as a superficial infection. Treat prophylactically for DVT. We do not encourage aggressive manipulation of force movements because that uh, can cause uh, fractures and uh, arthrofibrosis. So you want to make sure that the movements are active. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And uh, would you like me to go to my next talk or do we, how do you want to do that? Yeah. What is your next talk? Sorry? What is your next talk? Uh, I was asked if I could uh, would speak on uh, current trends and future perspective in knees. I'm happy to do that or we can have Suri give his talk, uh, whichever way you want to do it. Some questions uh, for on your talk, uh, uh, would you like now or later? I, I am I'm open either way, uh, Dr. Naik, whatever works for the, for the organizers. Uh, I, I think, think, we, I think we would ask you some questions before you go to the next one, sir. Is that all right? Sure. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, Tripathi, sir, you want uh, Yeah, there are some questions. Uh, one is that uh, about the incision approach. Uh, what is that? There is a lot of uh, uh, debate about mid-vastus, sub and uh, conventional parapetalus. What exactly uh, the benefits and uh, uh, I think... Uh, drawbacks of all these incisions. Yeah. So, Dr. Tripathi, I mean, just to take a, a leaf out of uh, Suri's book, uh, you know, when you look at hips, uh, there are people who do lateral, direct anterior, posterior, posterior lateral. Mm -hmm. it, it's really what you get comfortable with. We have typically used a midline incision, which is literally not a midline, midline incision. It's a little to the middle side. Uh, we take a medial parapetalate incision. We have uh, on occasions used the midvastus. It's a good approach, but we find that uh, we actually breach the vastus medialis, which you don't like. So we've gone away from that. Um, the reason also for using a anteromedial uh, parapetalate incision is in the event that you have a difficult situation like a stiff knee, you can actually extend that and go on to a rectus snip. We use that extensively for all our revision, all, a lot of our revisions, very stiff knees, ankylosed knees, and that has served us very, very well. So uh, I know a lot of my friends and colleagues use subvastus and they have excellent uh, outcomes and results. It is really what you get comfortable with, what gives you good exposure, that gives you the peace of mind that you, you're able to look around and do the knees. So I think approaches is really like, um, uh, a car, you know, you, you learn what works for you, what you're comfortable with. And the, is, we just feel that an anteromedial with a midline incision with the option of extending it to a rectus snip gives us the freedom to tackle just about any type of knee without having to change courses. So thank you, sir. Uh, I have a question, sir. Yes, there's a question uh, also, Raj Gopal. Uh, why is, why is it that so many knees after surgery, which apparently look all right on table, at the end of it, uh, end up with varus knee? And how to prevent them? Any te surgical technical tips that you can give? So, so that, that, that's a great question, Rajiv. I, I think uh, medial release is critical. I somehow feel a little challenged when I hear people talking about the kinematic approach and not having to do soft tissue releases. People who are computer navigators also talk about not having to release soft tissues. 
and adjusting the bone cuts. Now that is a completely different philosophy. Um, for me, I mean, I I grew up with you know uh, with John Insull, and if you hear people like Chet Ranawat, Bob Booth, and a lot of these people um, uh, talking, and certainly our experience. So we do a post uh, release all the way to the posterior corner. Sometimes we'll release a semi-membranosus tendon in very severe deformities. Uh, we have just sent out an article where we actually release the posterior lateral corner in very severe various deformities to take away the, the torsional element. Uh, so it has to be a sequential release. There cannot be one release that will work everywhere. If you've got a five or seven, 10 degrees of various, you might be able to get away without a medial release. But at 25, 30 degrees, you have to take down the osteophytes. So take down the osteophytes, you have to release all the way to the back. And if you do that, and when you're doing, before you start doing your cuts, you want to make sure that you've corrected that deformity completely. I'm talking about the varus and the valgus knee. And if you do that, then your final titration of soft tissues with your trials in place becomes a very, very uh, fun thing. It becomes very simple. And you can then titrate your uh, your releases and get um, get your ideal alignment. We actually aim for a zero alignment. We do not aim for a three or a five degrees of valgus. The reason for it is in obese patients, your X-rays look perfect. The patients are extremely unhappy because their knees rub against each other. You know, particularly obese patients, patients who have a BMI of 32, 35, and more they find it very difficult to walk. So we aim for a zero alignment, not a three degree alignment. Thank you. Sir, I have got a question, sir. There is a lot of controversy nowadays regarding the doing the surgery of both the knees simultaneously or separately. So what is your protocol, sir? So uh, again, I think, I think that's a great question. We have a very defined protocol. Patients have to be surgically fit for a bilateral. We have an age cutoff, 75 is our cutoff. Uh, they should be ASA 2 or lower for a bilateral. They should have not more than two controlled uh, uh, comorbidities. Patients who have cardiac history, who had stenting or who had uh, coronary bypass, patients who had uh, transplant, liver, uh, immune compromised, we do not do uh, bilaterals. Um, but otherwise, we do bilaterals for most of our patients. Almost 75, 80, 90 percent of our patients are bilateral. But we are very, very picky. We are extremely careful about it. Um, the ones that we are not able to do one stage bilateral, we do a staged. By staged, we mean we go in again in between 48, 72 hours. Again, it's an issue which is slightly controversial because at 72 hours, some people say you have the maximum catabolic state. Uh, you are in negative nitrogen balance. But when we have last about eight, 10 years, we have shifted from uh, 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 from one stage bilateral to two stage bilateral. We have, our morbidity has dropped considerably. So that's our protocol that we use. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any, any comments on the patella surfacing? That is another uh, uh, topic uh, often discussed between CR knees and uh, uh, yeah, 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 Rajiv. I've always been the non. -con I thought I will ask you. Yeah, I, I am a non-resurfacer, and uh, we, we've had a lot of uh, debates and arguments and discussions, particularly in panels, where, you know, where I have presented this. Uh, I have really nothing against people who resurface the patella. For me, it's one more structure that can fail. And in today's day and age, where you have very, very trochlear-friendly implants. Um, we haven't resurfaced the patella in the last about 20 years. And we have, we have not re regretted it. Uh, as a trial, we, 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 try, we actually wrote up this, uh, this study. In that, uh, we resurfaced on one side and didn't on the other. But the results were very, very similar. Literature is, again, right down the middle. There are, there are resurfaces. UK, for instance, has very low incidence of resurfaces. Um, America, the, the US has a very high incidence. Uh, again, if you go east, you go towards Korea, um, very low resurfacing rates. Australia is about 70% resurfaces. Uh, China is somewhere in between a lot of non-resurfaces. So I think if the jury is out on that. As long as you balance your knee, you get your extensor tendon where it belongs. 
you get a rotation right, I don't think it really makes a lot of difference. So does the philosophy change between a CR knee and a PS knee regarding re, uh, resurfacing of patella? That was the question. Um, so the PS folks actually say that you should resurface the patella. Uh, and in fact, uh, they say even for CR surgeons, people who, who have, uh, for instance, uh, rheumatoids, they should resurface the patella. Like I said, we. Uh, it's a very debatable, controversial uh, subject. I don't know that I have the exact answer for that, except to say that uh, we, we don't use it for rheumatoids. We don't resurface for, for a lot of our knees. In fact, none of our knees we resurface. Thanks, Rajmukha. In the meantime, our UPO president, Dr. Apur uh, has joined. Uh, welcome on behalf of Allahabad Society. I welcome you, sir. Welcome, Dr. Apur. So, Dr. Rajesh, Rajesh, do we still have time for questions? I think yes. we'll just uh, finish and then uh, in the next lecture, then again we'll take the questions. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Okay. Rajesh, sir, uh, for the next session. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Yeah, Rajiv, do you want me to go with the second? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead with the second page. Yeah. Okay. All right. Right. So after the after that talk, this is a little bit of a futuristic talk, and you know we'll quickly run through um, some of the interesting things. Uh, and you know just to look at it historically, you know it, it'd just be interesting. When we started doing knees almost 32, 33 years ago, uh, it was interesting because I had one femoral size on the one for the right, one for the left. I had one poly for the right knee and one for the left knee. The femoral uh, implants had to be autoclaved. They were not, um, uh, they were not autoclaved. We had virtually no instruments. And uh, needless to say, it was a struggle. It took us an enormous length of time, it took us almost five and a half hours. And then um, these are the kind of knees that were available at that point in time. Uh, this is the IV one. We did, we did a small number of these. Uh, this is the original I uh, have Insal uh, Burstein knee uh, that Chitranavat and John Insal uh, came together. Um, when I was in England, this is what we grew up with, the, the geomedic and the, the this is the constraint of the shears, the Sheehan knees that failed catastrophically. Uh, this is the real first knee that uh, we I saw being put in in 1983. Uh, this did not have a petala, this did not have a petala groove. And in the 80s, uh, these were the kind of uh, knees that were available to us, uh, the Freeman Samuelson, the Kinemax, the Miller Galantia one, and uh, um, a lot of these were actually CR knees. And if we did sacrifice the cruciate, we did not actually substitute it. And there were no petalar buttons. Uh, and uh, interestingly enough, these are these my experiences uh, with uh, the uh, cementless knees, you can see screws and you can see the slide on the right, you can see polyethylene wear on the, uh, on, on the uh, medial side. You can see that it's slightly unbalanced, but this lasted out about 13. A lot of these knees lasted out for 13 to 15 years. At that point of time, surprisingly enough, we didn't get too much of by way of cement either. So uh, the philosophy of the cementless option was quite attractive. And I started in 87 and up through until 99, so almost 12 years I did cementless knees. And interestingly enough, our, uh, we had excellent survivorship uh, of the cementless platform. 10 years was 97 and 15 years was uh, 93%. And all the knees that were revised were revised because of the poor polyethylene. These were flat and flat designs, polyethylene that was uh, um, sterilized in air. Uh, so I was really sort of wedded to this philosophy. And again, the, the issue of the, because I grew up on the CR uh, diet, uh, I retained the cruciate and I continue to do that till, till now. And various uh, authors, including ourselves, we have reported on this. Uh, we believe that the uh, knee functions do not really deteriorate to using the CR option and our 15 year results are 92%. And various, uh, various authors, um, we won't go into this today. I think um, the, I was just looking up for one of my other talks. Uh, the incidence of CR surgeons in the world 
uh, is about 53% and 47% are PSUs. It's been a, a, almost a role reversal because about 15 years, 20 years ago, almost 70% were PS surgeons and 18, uh, 20 to 30% were CR. So there's been a bit of a shift in that uh, issue. So just to really sort of go through and say that almost 90, 95% of all the knees that we have done are CR knees. We have uh, done PS selectively for some studies and we'll quickly sort of run through uh, some of the examples of uh, what we have done before we go get on to what is currently available. This is a rheumatoid, as you might imagine, bony ankylos knees. Uh, this is another patient um, with, with uh, bony ankylos. This we did a cementless uh, at nine years. This lady died of a myocardial infarction, a malunited. Uh, high tibial osteotomy where we did a CR knees. These are basically examples of very severe virus uh, knees. Uh, this is our 18 year follow-up of these knees with good function. Uh, so basically just to sort of reiterate that I'm not trying to make a case for uh, the audience to shift to CR, but just to say that contrary to what a lot of us believe or we are taught, that CR knees is not for the severe deformed knees. It's just to put, you, put another perspective to it. We respect people who use PS knees and PS is an excellent uh, surg surgical option with very, very good results. Um, over the years, what happened was we, uh, when we started from the monoblock and we went into the more modular issues, uh, while it solved one problem, it created the second problem. And that was the issue of osteolysis. So modularity gave made surgery more uh, flexible, but it also introduced this uh, particulate uh, issue that was very well recognized at that time with hips, particularly the, the cemented hips, the Charlie or uh, varieties, and that started to show its uh, ugly face on the knee. So the, this is one of my earliest knees that we did. This is a 31 year follow-up of a cementless Miller of uh, Freeman Samuelson. And interestingly, if you see, the tibia is a all poly uncemented uh, tibia. We don't actually have that. Um, uh, more, uh, more to the point that in today's day and age where we use modular options, one of the key issues that has been uh, troubling all of us as knee surgeons is the, uh, is the occurrence of uh, loosening. A lot of knees are defined as aseptic. I think I'd caution you that all aseptic knees need to be checked out and made sure that they're not infective in etiology before you actually embark on revising these knees. Uh, different types of implants came along the way. This is a revision implant that came out for the CR knee, interestingly enough, for about, it was available for three to four years before it was withdrawn. And uh, the general philosophy was people were outraged that how could a CR knee be a revision option? So, uh, the, the point we just discussed in terms of bilaterals, we do it under the ages of 75 with not more than two comorbidities. Uh, patients' cardiac issues, stents, renal issues are done staged, and all uh, cardiac and hypertensive patients, we do a concomitant character Doppler for them. Uh, coming to now the 2000s, I think th th these were some of the absolute disasters that I've been a part of, uh, that I've witnessed. Um, we were introduced to this concept of a carbon impregnated polyethylene with uh, low um, wear properties. We, we used about 15, 20 of them. And very quickly, within about 12 to 18 months, we withdrew these, we revised these because of uh, synovitis. It was almost like metallosis. The entire synovium was black. This is one of my own knees that I, I, I revised. Uh, and it was withdrawn and condemned and put into the archives. Uh, the single most catastrophic uh, development in knee surgeries was the introduction of this MIS surgeries. You can see these incisions. Uh, I've been witness to some absolute catastrophic uh, disasters, uh, both here and overseas. I, we were in Brisbane doing a MIS uh, workshop when one of uh, uh, authors from one of the very named surgeons from US operated through one of these incisions and uh, we had to revise the knee within about seven hours of the index surgery. But there have been some very interesting emerging technologies and it, that has been in the material science. Uh, this is the, the trabecular metal or the tantalum uh, implants. 
today we have the option of using uh, cementless uh, tantalum uh, femurs and tibias but the real role has been in the use of these uh, sleeves and cones we have uh, published extensively on this and it's been a real life saver uh, in patients who have a dome patella a very thin patella you can use inset patella and the, the real role is to make up for uh, major bone loss and bone defects because this is both osteogenic and osteoconductive uh, some examples of cementless uh, tm implants this is almost 9 uh, years of our index surgery we have gone beyond the routine and cases of malignancies we have done uh, the megaprosthesis the tumor uh, gmrs uh, we also do a fair number of unicompartment surgeries and uh, we have almost a 14 year follow up with about 94% uh, survivorship at the moment um crossing over into the uh, psi options we started with this in 2005 6 and very quickly gave it up because uh, this did not control your rotational alignment and even in the hands of the developers there has been a 38 or there was a 38% conversion to conventional options um and at the moment is probably just left as a historical um data by Uh, navigation again i think uh, it caught the fa- imagination and fancy of a lot of surgeons uh, there are some surgeons who continue to use it but and i guess in very experienced hands it gives good results but overall globally navigation is an outdated concept very very few surgeons <coughs> continue to use this those those that do swear by it with excellent outcomes and the real issue that happens is uh, the rotation is not always correct and uh, it's important to understand that it's computer aided and not directed and this is an example of an anterior sloping tibia that had to be revised and a laterally placed uh, uh, tibial component the real challenge that we are seeing today is the issue of revisions and this is going to be the new paradigm that we're going to have to sort of uh, embrace because the with the numbers of to- primary total knees exploding uh the incidence of revisions has really increased exponentially and you'll see a whole assortment of these uh, of these uh, revision situations and these are going to be the new paradigm uh coming to the thing that we're all talking about the robotics uh, so we've had experience of the navio and i know uh, suri has um, extensive experience at his center with the with the navio which has been a excellent um, tool we've also had some experience with the mako uh, mako design though we have uh, uh, far more experience with the navio uh, it's a handheld bur uh, the mako is a haptic field um, resection uh, option and there are uh, several other companies that are coming out with uh, with the robotic option uh, and this is really the kind of screen that you see and uh, th- this is uh, pretty much one of our surgeries where using the mako so there is you see the two lines within which the uh, the blade works uh, this is a haptic field which means that if you go beyond that uh, line the the saw uh, stops so it prevents soft tissue damage uh, so preoperative x rays of a patient so you get a pretty good alignment using these navigation options so to, to summarize the whole thing the, the real issue is regardless of what technology you use you have to understand your basics you have to be critical of yourself and the cannot overemphasize the importance of uh, teamwork and recognizing our, your failures especially your own and choose not to ignore them and finally i would only um, submit that you know you want to follow techniques rather than technology and these are uh two of my earliest uh, patients one just passed away about 8 months ago the other patient is still alive this is 30 31 years of uncemented technology and basically all we did was follow the the the, the philosophies uh that were meant to be balancing tissues uh, using the right size of implant and the patient has continues to do extremely well so our present position we we do cr we do not reserve the patella given a choice we prefer the uncemented if costs are not an issue we typically use monoblocks and we believe that long term survivorship and uh, outcomes is both surgeon and technique dependent we <clears throat> obviously we uh, we use technology to a great extent but we use this rather judiciously and we prefer not to be called a slave to it um we still believe that monoblock designs are excellent 
unsimmetric options will be a, a thing that is going to come back in a big way. And fundamentally, to sort of last line, what I learned from John Insull in 80, in, in 98, 99, restore balance and restore mechanical access and get secure fixation. And their own 30 year survivorship of 69% is a testimony to uh, these details and basics. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thanks, Raj Gopal. That, that was wonderful. You made a lot of points clear, uh, more so regarding the navigation. Uh, one or two questions. Rajesh, I think, Rajesh, Rajesh, sir, can we take the lecture, Dr. Suri, then uh, questions? Yeah, okay, fine, yeah. fine, 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 perfect. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot for chairing the session and Dr. Rajgopal for uh, giving the overview of uh, totally the present, past, and future of the knee replacement. Now, may I invite Dr. Um, Professor Amit Rastogi, who has been the past president of uh, UP chapter of Indian Orthopedic Association, as well as the president of Central Zone of Indian Orthopedic Association. Presently, he is a professor and consultant orthopedic department, doing a lot of uh, joints at the IMS BHU RRC. Dr. Rastogi, sir. Just unmute your, uh, unmute and uh, take the chair. Dr. Rastogi, sir. Yeah. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah, you're, you're, go, go ahead with the. Dr. Amit. Hello. Ah, yeah. sir, please go ahead, you're audible, sir. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, fine. But we cannot see you. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kedi. And uh, it is my uh, uh, pleasure to introduce Dr. Pichai Sunaran. Uh, uh, anybody who does any arthroplasty, I think, will always be, uh, will know his name. And I don't think he requires much introduction. But for the sake of form, he is the joint director at the Asian Joint Reconstruction Institute, which is associated with the SRM Institute for Medical Science in Chennai. Completed his graduate training and master of surgery in orthopedics at the University of Bombay in 1986 and obtained further fellowship training in arthroplasty and reconstructive surgery at the, of the joints for, at uh, the Hospital for Special Surgery under Professor Chitranjan Ranavat. Again, also at the Wagner Clinic in Germany with uh, Professor Heinz Wagner and was awarded the Indo German Orthopedic Fellowship at the Hip Service in Salzpital, Bern in Switzerland with Professor Reinhold Dans. He has been in active practice with a special focus in arthroplasty of the hip and knee since 1994 and was elected president of the Indian Society of Hip and Knee Surgeons in 2011 and 12. Was appointed adjunct professor of orthopedics at the Tamil Nadu MGR Medical University in 2012. His current special interests are revision surgeries of hip and knee, osteotomies and acetabular trauma and bone banking. Navigation assisted surgeries has been the other subject of his interest and has been he has been the lead of the design team for the CT-based PSI, which was developed indigenously with industry partners. He's actively involved in teaching and training courses. I welcome you, uh, Dr. Surinaran, and uh, I hope, and uh, I'm sure all of us will benefit from your excellent lecture. Please go ahead with it. Dr. Surinaran? Please Dr. Unmute, sir, Dr. Suri, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Rastogi, for the kind words. As usual, I think when the guy starts talking, Sir, sound is. Dr. Sunaran. Yeah. The volume is very low. Can you increase the mic pickup volume? Yeah, I'm 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 on full volume now. Can you hear oh, me now? Okay, sir. Yeah, it's okay, sir. This is much better. Sir, please continue. Yeah. So I think it's indeed a pleasure and thanks to the Prayagraj Orthopedic Society for this uh, wonderful meeting. What I was trying to mention was when Ashok speaks, speaks, wisdom flows. I mean that is the level of experience and the years he has put in into one single joint, and that's phenomenal. My brief was to talk on the other side about the hip, then now on what's ahead. And I chose what's hot and what's not today because uh, I thought we can bring up some of these short trick points to this. 
hip surgery 2020 if you look at it i think there are too many conceptual changes that has happened in a very short span of probably a decade or so and often times it's confusing not only to the patient but also to the surgeon what is right which way to go and then what to choose and we keep debating about this uh, some with a solid sort of a data some without uh, what you have seen are the myriad changes that has happened that if you have been following or performing from the 90s or the late 80s to the 20s then in terms of design the materials have changed the techniques have changed the also more importantly what you notice also is the patient expectations are pretty much different than what it was the other time the functional expectations and aspiration of the patients and for us to keep in tune and make sure probably we are able to satisfy at least to a great extent most of these changes is a challenge and that does require certain amount of inputs and change uh, uh, from the changes that's been happening if you look at about seven decades go behind in time from the 50s to what happened in the joint hip joint surgeries all the some of these implants are pretty much familiar to us if you have worked in the united kingdom you are familiar with all and these were then you know we talked about the austin move the cemented thompsons uh, <clears throat> the ring processes there the cup arthroplasties all were uh, available with the plexiglass everything but then at that point in time with all these uh, anatomic variations and the changes you find or the pathologies we treat uh, relief of pain was the main answer people wanted a relief of pain and some movement in the stiff joints you give them and they were pretty much happier because these were all the Uh, very highly deformed ankylo situations to a failed proximally migrating joints probably post tuberculosis so many other situations so the objective was limited the options were limited but present day hips if you look at the design and the changes they hardly resemble to what we started with the modern changes but if you just have a little closer look uh, you find that what were changes have essentially been revisits with the concepts that existed at one point in time you refine them you change them and in terms of manufacture materials or probably the design and how you apply and understood with time we have understood the hip mechanics far better and then we are able to replicate not the anatomical changes but also try to bring in the metabolic and the functional changes into it so for example if you see these are again in indian uh, our experiences if you a cup arthroplasty it looks quite silly we say it as a failure but then the cup changed with the stem on the other side and it became a resurfacing first it was unipolar resurfacing then it was total resurfacing or you find uh, the plexiglass the other one which you see in the lower left that design with a stem with a head made of plexiglass probably is a forerunner to what we call the silent hip or the you know birmingham method resection type of a design which you see the far right the ring processes where you screwed in into the sciatic buttress a solid fixation which worked probably has given way to us in the difficult hip situation where you don't have acetabulum to a pedestal cup the pedestal cup draws its experience purely from the ring the direction to go today of course it came in it went off but again probably it will have a selective use because with your 3d reconstructions and the 3d models you can get it into the real good bone and a salvage is excellent with this so in short what i look at is that all this though it looks old and the failed designs they were truly state of art at that point in time and that formed a basis on which one evolved and probably resolved the con uh, the conflicts and then brought in with the newer designs and prosthesis example this is a surgery which i would say was done at the age of 11 spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia extremely painful hip joints with secondary spine changes it was done in india i think cup arthroplasty it helped the boy for about 9 years it started becoming symptomatic probably around 20 maybe when then he presented to me at that point it was 22 years old to us and then you jumped from that cup arthroplasty no burn bridges were burnt we could get in a probably a good modern prosthesis a better prosthesis restoring the physiological offsets so a cup served in 9 years is a long time especially for a pediatric patient who is crippled i think this was a great solution so i mean we need to look at it from that philosophical point of view in that era what health what were the options then for that point or for example take the thrust plate the thrust plate is basically like a dhs you put in and then you fit in the head with a socket great concept it had its own intrinsic little small problems but come to think of it you could have taken away all the problems of a stem loosening and the secondary issues we have during the revisions and if this has to fail all we needed was take out and put a standard stem and you are out of the woods 
So I think they brought in the unique thoughts, concepts, materials, font. But one thing is that as you saw, go historically into the various steps of evolution of all, like Ashok mentioned, I think so much you learn, some taught the way forward, but also at the same time, some of the developments in the, in the recent times, it also has taught us what not to do. I think that also is a very, very important lesson in these cases. So if you start with the modern total hip, I think we, I think that this requires no additional elaboration. It's a cemented Chanli done by the black book steps. You have the trochanteric osteotomy. You have a polythene cup, slightly medialized socket. So this low frictional concept with a solid cemented components also looked into certain amount of biomechanical perspectives of decreasing the shear force, it will. But what was unknown at that time were two elements which we understood over the next 40 years. That's the tissue response. What initially was thought cement, but actually it was to the polyethylene and the wear issues and their consequences. This is something you learned over time, a 20th century disease, and we found the cure to a great extent. That's how Will Harris puts it. A picture from 1970s done, 1974 classical Chanli, until it failed 17 years later, and I had the occasion to revise it at that point in time. But then, needless to say, he was the library and the librarian at the general hospital. But then it served him 17 great years for an ankylosing person, and the revision would give him another 20 years. So I think these are very successful runs with this process. Lots to learn from these areas. And remember that this gave 20 years survival with all what we do not do now. We don't do a trochanteric osteotomy in most situations. We don't use more uh, a 22 head most of the times. Conventional poly, which is again not used anymore, cemented, question mark. I think we'll come back to that. And the components monoblock, like Ashok mentioned, you only one had one stem, one offset, or probably maybe one or two oftentimes. So I think with all this, if you understood the basic mechanics and what to do and what to restore, probably you ended up often with an excellent business. And look at the stems broadly. These are very long-term follow-ups, 22 years, 29 years, 30 years. I think they, the stem, it looks as pristine as it was probably at the year one or the post-operative X-ray. But so on the stem side, I think the results have been spectacular with this. Uh, but of course, we had always had the problem with the socket side, which today we know was more because of the polyethylene and the consequences. It slowly wore and then we had big uh, cavitary defects on the acetabular side. So I think uh, if you somebody talks about the total hip, cemented total hip, is it irrelevant or irrelevant? I think it is very, very much relevant today. I think it is never fair to say that cemented hip is out. I think there is a circle because we are probably more familiar with the non-cemented. We perform them to a higher degree, but cemented are extremely relevant, both in terms of outcomes, in terms of cost, in terms of performance. The only downside to the cemented is that it's a very, very technique sensitive. It is just not putting today. You have to accept, understand, and then perform the third generation cementation of having you no know, no cavitations, pressurized mixation, pressurize the cement into, get a micro interdigitation. You do all this, your results will be extremely good. So, so far as what, what's hot and not, cemented hips is still very much alive. I think it can be used in most situations. And if you're, there, there are enough groups like the Exeter, there are groups like the Wrightington, the whole of Nordic states, they use purely a cemented design even now, based upon the outcome data, if you read the Swedish registry, only on the acetabular side, people have moved away certainly towards a non-cemented because the results seem to be much better. In terms of what do you do or what do you at all, what is in and what is out, regarding the choice of stems, I think any stem which is having the sharp borders is totally out. All these talk of banana stems are totally gone. I think because they, they do create stress razors, the cement mantle is non-uniform with this. What one should use is the composite beam concept or the taper uh, subsidence, like the Exeter design. Then these two have stood the test of time. They have worked well. I think there's no reason why anybody should change the design. These are extremely polished stems. I think the matte finish anyway, again, is a thing which is of, a, of the past into history. Look for round tapers, centralize the processes, have a good cement mantle around, and then have, let it subside a little bit because then the hoop stresses go away <coughs> and become unstable. What is out, another thing, is the conventional polyethylene. I think it is totally gone. I think it has no place anymore. I think, in fact, the manufacturers should not be supplying this. 
one has to there is a un uh, probably uh, uh, body of evidence today for the crossing polyethylene way too much to be contemplated or discussed and look at the wear rates from the australian registry if you see metal on non polyethylene from 10% it has dropped down to about 5 to 4% almost a 50% decrease in the wear so i think if we put the long story short uh, non uh, crosslink polyethylene is totally out and use the crosslink poly wherever you use only one question is when you use a bigger size heads with a very thin cross poly i think there's always a concern probably whether it is cracks because of the extreme thinness because they're a bit more brittle as compared to the non uh, crosslink polyethylenes so the ideal features when you use a stem or choose a stem which is a non cemented variety again i think the tapers or the double tapers or what are called the sandwich blades work extremely well across the board whether it is a corail or the clls or whether it is you are using the accolade or the vimula they work well the goal is to have a proximally integrating uh, stem preferably a bone conserving and they should have a design that helps you with the relative stability most importantly to restore the physiology i think if they can give you the variable offsets some of the designs do give you i think that helps you a lot in this cases and with regard to version adjustment uh, i think it went modular we have the tubular designs or the designs like the stem and sleeve concept like s from gives you this option if should you use to, uh, need to use in dysplastic situations understand the stem i think what is most important the message that comes out with all this variety is you understand the stem what it offers whether it increases the proximal fixation and proximal filling with the incremental sizes whether it gives you the stability and support at what level it gives are they coated non coated and most important what has been the history of that design over probably a decade to 15 years so i won't go much into this there are various fixation concepts you can have pure proximal meta diaphyseal or a total total uh, fixation and anatomic fixations some of them It, uh, there are designs which you came for the left and the right side specific but they came and they went because they didn't offer any great additional advantage diaphyseal fixations probably may be very limited i would not go one important aspect when you choose a stem is think of the next surgery that's very crucial what is going to happen and that is the only lesson probably it's go so short stems make an intuitive uh, sort of a advantage in this case <clears throat> canal filling again we do away from it because it takes off bone or it fills up too much and the redo probably becomes extremely difficult probably a corail or a summit to take it out is going to be extremely difficult so think of that rather than the primary fixation you can with proper preparation get a primary fixation with anything so the fixation concept when you use a non cemented on the other side is a load transfer as proximal as possible this is the normal physiology if you take the normal if you see the primary and the secondary tension trabecular on the proximal trochanter you see they dissipate most of the faces it doesn't come down to the diaphysis so that is the lesson we learn if you can do the same thing with the prosthesis i think it will be as good for example if you see some of the short stems that is their endeavor they try to dissipate it right at the proximal but if it is not anatomically possible for some reason then you bring it down to the meta metaphysical area and if you should you use to go further down i think stems as short as possible or as much as feasible you try to decide so one motto here is basically consider the revision and explantation for any reason that is not easy and if somebody ever told that, that uncemented is easy to remove for revision that is the farthest from the truth which you can go you know a cemented just comes in 5 minutes this to 3 hours at some times let's talk uh, talking about modularity i think it has become a necessary tool you are now uh, sort of slaves to this give you a monoblock you are scratching your head am i right am i not right you are too accustomed to this for comfort uh, to for comfort otherwise so i think that is true and of course there are a lot of virtues to this helps the fine tuning of the alignment the length stability and of course the offsets so initially it started with the head and neck and then subsequently the neck again became modular to give the virginal specific uh, designs also but what was quickly seen was if you have a modularity just of the stem with the brooches and you have a 127 132 offsets especially in the indian context in most of the young short women and ladies with a short offset like you see the picture on the top right i think it makes a great sense there because then you can 
if you tend to increase the horizontal offset, the functional problem is the trochanteric pain. These patients are never happy if you increase the offset. So if you put a corail in that stem, you will find that you are really increasing the offset. And when you have such a high offset, you will find there's a trochanteric pain and discomfort. And though the x-rays look great, the patients are not happy at all. So in, that, in those situations, it's, uh, I think a dual offset, if it is available, you can adjust to the morphology of the patient, almost customizing it to this. And you have the modularity of the head. But when you added increased mortal, uh, modularity, both for the neck, the head, and the stem, what, are, what was happening was we brought in the new problem of tribocorrosion. The tribocorrosion became a big problem in the, this design. This was again introduced with a lot of fanfare. You had 32 types of the necks which you could change and play around like a mechano. Aggravate, this was aggravated by the design, the load on the taper, and the bending torsional moments. Because the moment you have a long stem and a short point, the torsional moments are very high. And they started failing, breaking, dislocating, and it was withdrawn. Today, I think this concept of having a modular neck is totally out. There's no question. We are not revisiting it. The third point that comes is the expectation of the patient to satisfy. What we want, we normally talk about the maximal range without dislocation. That is only one aspect of it. That is, we are trying to prevent a catastrophe or a complication. That is not the patient's expectation. That is a given. We have to give a hip which is not dislocating. But the patient's expectations end up as a full function, no limitations. They want to feel like a normal. And this requirement is getting higher and higher. Initially, we said, that don't sleep on the side, abduct their limbs post-operative. Now, today, we leave them free. They're not even thought about. Then we said they should not squat. But today, that is not a limitation. You're allowed to squat. You're allowed to sit cross-legged, whatever you do. Basically, because you are able to get a better head, better fixation, better alignment. And now the patient says, I want to run. Whether I'm going to allow the repetitive sort of a thrust on the hip or he wants to do this sort of a jumping, are we allowed? Is it possible? I think these are the things. The bar keeps getting higher every five years the patients want to do. And it is not untrue. In that regard, we also need to define what is high performance. Just because the patient is taking a five-kilometer walk and he's able to squat, it is not a high performance. We are talking of extreme high performance Basically, it's a restoration of totally original lifestyles. There are some of these nerds who want it and who do it. And to identify what, uh, what is truly high performance, uh, that is why the, the, the scoring system had come in, the impact and cycle score, to see what they do. And it is this that is being uh, looked or used to assess these high impact activities. Harlan Amstrud and his colleagues from California, I think they have designed these devices, which was modified in between. But then the activity rate basing is the one way to do. And it is not untrue. If you lose a lot of these people, these are some of the patients resurfacing. Surface replacement, though, today it is, people say, oh, no, no, it is out. It is truly not out. There is a very select group that we should be considering hip replacements. Not, nothing else can satisfy. You want to ski down skill, uh, the downhill like this, as a full competitive athlete. I think if, if it's done, resurfacing is the only thing that can give you that level of function. And some of these athletes uh, have apparently be, have been followed up every year for the metal ions to see whether they wear out. And it's also seen they reach the steady state within about two to three years. And after that, the metal levels doesn't go up or down. So there, there's a huge uh, reason for that. In fact, the picture to the right, uh, the person, and this is uh, 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 the, these are the competitors who are doing the Fiji Eco Challenge. If you're interested, I think you must see it on the Netflix. Is about 10 uh, series part. It was 11 day competition with 670 kilometers across mountains, oceans, and uh, terrains of all sides, rock climbing in some areas. And this person to the left, Jason Magnus, underwent a resurfacing actually, actually it was done in Chennai. My colleague Vijay had done this in our, in our place at the AGRI. And he participated this year. And if you look at those activities, nothing else can do this but. A resurfacing. So I think there's a big uh, justification to say that this is feasible and it is possible. And what can be a better thing like Andy Murray having a resurfacing and then he's trying to win and then finalize again. So it is ideal for very high demand individuals. Absolutely ideal. Good pathology. That is the bone has to be of the adequate size and the quality. Large head size. If you do at the 50 and 52 or uh, no, to a 48, they don't, they have not done well. But you have a 54, 58 size heads, they do extremely well. 
and the morphology should be acceptable you know all the other factors shall come to what failed and went into disrepute with the hips were essentially malalignment number 1 some design issues with the certain designs where they got the diametric clearances long so the fluid free lubrication was very poor so because of all these reasons it failed the procedure or a concept by itself did not fail and some of the designs continue to remain a phr today we can vouch or a converse they have worked extremely well service the patient extremely well so what is crucial to think of is look and understand the risk factors and extremely strict selection criteria frameable favorable proximal anatomy of the head neck no extensive changes no cysts and osteoporotic changes keep the weight a little low not many surgeries as a surface arthropathy risk index should be in the acceptable range but what is more important to me than this as i look at it is select the patient also select the surgeon and select the design if you need to have that absolutely spectacular results i think all three needs to go all the same not every resurfacing is the same not every way you do the resurfacing is the same it is working well people who have been wedded to this philosophy have been doing it for years on end personally i did it for a little while i gave up but i don't think i would proceed with it because it needs a lot of precision extremely lot of precision but mind you i think if your metal was the worry and that's why people are walking away i think ceramic ceramic resurfacing is now in practice some of them are still in sort of uh, trials in closed groups not really released into the market the one or two other designs are there and one needs to watch this space how it works and how it's going to perform over a longer period of time so the story is still not over so for the resurfacing there is select indication we should consider but the other offshoot that came the large head metal on metal of course is a clear no i think uh, today if you look at this it is totally off you should never do because this again like we mentioned about the uh, neck designs the torque at the junction was quite high because of the large head and the short small thin necks the thin neck with a large head created a grot of great amount of torque with a tribo corrosion and that led to catastrophic effects so the torque induced tribo corrosion which happens with a large head has totally taken it out today it's again out of the market should not be even talked about or thought about but on the other side one could use the benefit of the large heads up to size 36 wherever feasible i think they work well if you use a metal on uh, 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 if you hard on soft that is the uh, the uh, poly cup which is of course has to be a cross link you have a little possibility to increase it more than what you used to do before but that will be determined by basically the outer diameter but beyond 36 if you use a stem and a head i don't think there appears to be any uh, uh, benefit some of them go to 40 the size is around 60 plus so that the ratios are maintained but overall a 36 kit can give you as much function and as much improvement in the range and stability in fact using this large head uh, uh, large head with a stem was the one that increased the studies and the emerging subject of tribo corrosion and trunionosis then retrospectively looking back you realize that trunionosis is a problem not only even with the 28 heads what you see as the blackening thing which you find during revisions with the 28 head and the dark thing it is not it is basically a trunion wear this is simply important i as i look at it not because it's a problem but if you have to revise and if you decide to retain the stem if you have the lot of black sooty changes which is seen on the neck or the inside of the head taper do not use that stem because that trunion is damaged if you have to revise it without changing the stem you must use a sleeve along with the head so to understand what is the tribo corrosion i think these points need to be thought about some of them may probably need uh, uh, if you have an extreme sort of a, a reaction you probably need to consider also the important aspect of the metal ion studies in these cases so the issues to focus for the average orthopedic uh, practice and where we are not only doing the hips and doing most other things also look consider bone conserving designs with regard to the stems leave resurfacing unless you are wedded to the concept and doing it extremely well one off resurfacing one of year or a five a year will not be a very advisable situation because probably you may not get it right tribology in the ideal bearing of choice today i think basically is uh, we will come back to that again is uh, well metal on plastic or ceramic on plastic works equally well but if it is a high performance very young person and we expect then probably will go on hard on hard 
it is not metal on metal it is going to be ceramic on ceramic restore the hip kinematics focus more on the possibilities to get the horizontal the vertical offsets right the soft tissue tensions correct the closure of the capsules appropriate your results are far superior surgical approach i think like uh, dr ashok mentioned mis came mis went but i think we are in, at least unlike the knees in the hips you have settled somewhere in the middle Uh, then we have the other aspects of the direct anterior, the navigation, the smart tools. But when you choose any of these concepts, I think you must accommodate the expected and anticipated activity levels of this patient. So I won't want to go into this wear data that comes. We know that the ceramic on ceramic has the least wear, and so you can use it accordingly wherever possible, wherever useful. Only one point here is: if you are using a ceramic, avoid using the short head. the reason is the only one concern even with the delta ceramics sometimes is that if you use a short head the penetration of the neck into the head is almost till about 3 mm so the top of the, the polar area of the head is only about 3 mm it if you have a high impact injury it can splinter so if possible all the time use a standard head or a larger head that is one small suggestion which you use in these cases does everybody require all these hard on hard bearings and all the very ideal distributes i think snow there are other influencing variables like for example the disease and the bone quality the patient and the surgeon remember the moment you start using the hard on hard ceramic on ceramic or any of the other hard bearings the margin of error starts getting less and less your socket positioning has to be very precise a soft like a polyethylene is forgiving it compensates to some extent But hard on hard, no. Ah, this is what you call it. I was looking at something like this. No, that is not important. Yeah. The third issue it can be troublesome to the patients. So be aware of that. And most important, of course, I think we need to factor the economics of the situation. We need not be fanciful to put a ceramic all the time because the outcome and the results are as good with a cross poly with a ceramic. And if the ceramic delta ceramic is more expensive, you have the other option of using even an auxinium head. Which is somewhere in the middle, functionally as good as a ceramic, cost-wise I think much less than the delta ceramics. So that combination also works extremely well in these cases. Metal on polyethylene bearings, so long as they are not scratched, it is good. Plastic, they go, they are they are safe, they are durable for most clinical situations. Does it support high impact activities? I think it does. If you see some follow-up, some of our patients. Uh, that they have done and they are doing after all this and this gentleman with the x-ray on the left is about 5 weeks into the surgery and he was on a holiday swimming around completely squatting and doing things so so you don't have to inhibit so long as you get all the other factors right i think they will do well not a worry at all so ceramic and ceramic like i said we know that it works well done right the outcomes are great i think what is important is appropriate positioning of the ceramic and the locking of the ceramic liner into the metal shell that is where another point where probably we can go wrong and we can be this so active individuals are very high demand it's a excellent option the same for don't go up by the age i think one should be good at the physical activity of it the further bone conserving options i think uh, they have still not found a resting place there's the mid head resection design was taken out of the market not because it failed but basically the demand was not very high the silent hip i don't know it was from the deputy johnson which was being tried but didn't open up too much but it is a very hard the short head stems short stems have sort of come in basically because it accommodates one like i said the, the philosophy of a short fixation metaphysical fixation and also when you use the mis approaches or a small incision approaches i think they are pretty good in next level so i think that, that that is the by far the short stem and the, some of the, we, we did perform we do perform occasionally but i prefer to choose it only for the thin individuals maybe a single incision mis not the double but overall the short stems and even the proximal fixing hip they have not had a very smooth run this is they again very technique sensitive and if they fail they fail in varus and that has been a problem the one thing that has probably worked well is the design that came from the escolap the meta stem and the mayo design i think that have worked a little bit better so at best with regard to short stems what uh, is it in or out i think one can put a question mark probably it will evolve i think it will come in the primary situations mis surgery was a great wave 
it all followed in the early 2000s i think that was a way to go but what has happened today i think uh, that this uh, i look at it as a useful controversy our long incisions in the back became smaller the more precise the instrumentation improved because they were done for the mis which we now use on the regular surgery and hospitalization if you are able to perform properly and easily i think it is much better today i think accepted as i mean direct anterior is a way a lot of people are using it one can't uh, totally deny unless you practice but one thing i am really not certain which is whether it is very useful in our sort of environment lot of our cases are altered anatomy and most of the caucasian american cases are primary osteoarthrosis it is like doing in the uh, cadaveric lab you know you get that situation quite often most of the times so in that regard i think uh, uh, it's a very minimal direct anterior approach with small probably would be a little questionable and a little difficult and not comforting for us however of course if you master it nothing like it these are the type of incisions and to make it more conspect uh, uh, cosmetic the bikini anterior is again something which is practiced well in europe and there are great approaches but probably you need to be wedded to it again doing all the time repeatedly then probably you master it or you have the super path approach which is almost like putting in a nail very complex i mean you do it under image intensification it is like complicating a simple procedure but the choice is yours patients demand if you think you are happy happy with it practice it 10 times and proceed but for most practical purposes we have not been adopting any but if you know what we are toying up with the direct anterior basically for the in fracture next of femur where you want to replace in the elderly i think probably that makes a good beginning point where you can use that approach pretty much comfortably at this so what is the status of the mis hips today i think uh, is still valid to an extent not everybody qualified not all qualified you do need to have the special instrumentations training and familiarity but what will go well as i see in the subsequent days will be the navigation or the robot which may be used in conjunction with this where you don't need that much of an exposure because you will be using the robotic screen and probably you can execute the procedure well and the instrumentation unlike the robotic instrumentation of the 90s they are not so uh, the big thick and kind of space filling they are more probably pretty much in that regard but if any of us is an occasional user for this i don't think we should use it because it's going to be a disaster we'll end up with a couple of stem fractures some socket fractures dislocation this you know so i think it is best avoided in that case make your regular incision small by definitely the instrumentation that will be good the final point i want to share start talking also the dual mobility this is something which has come in uh, in the last about 10 15 years but uh, french have been using it from the 80s even in the primaries so in some of the case, uh, neuropathic situations or in the uh, case of very small women and some other indications i think dual mobility is a good option wherever we have a situation where there is a significant risk for hip instability the abnormal spinal spinal pelvic problems spinal deformities lower spinal fusions where there is a potential possibility that you may not be truly getting a proper physiological position of the socket anatomically it may be right but functionally it may not be right basically because you are not factoring other factors then probably a dual mobility is sort of added cushion to prevent the dislocation so probably i think at this point in time best is to select use it for the select and special situations regular use as a safety check better so that it won't dislocate or that the range will be better i think tread with caution very very important because we still have not got the results in the primaries beyond a long time and as early as last month you find the one first uh, sort of report coming from the mayo clinic and uh, they are warning about the dual mobility corrosion in vitro corrosion in the implants so i think the jury is still out i think we need to look at it with a lot of caution when before we start using it on a regular basis but certainly in all revisions and other situations it is a great addition to us what's hot going forward the three things that probably is happening is in maximizing the to maximize the performance and minimize the complications what is added now is a spinal pelvic considerations today a pelvis with both hips x ray as a pre operative tool is not enough in average you have to include the standing spine ap standing spine lateral x rays in flexion and extension and look at the pelvic incidence lumbar lordotic angle and how we are going to adjust more especially if they have undergone spine surgery more especially if they have undergone a spinal fusion fixation especially of the lumbosacral junction 
or probably a scoliosis. It will be a great tool. Like if you see the picture lower down, if it is a stiff spine in kyphosis and lordosis, the socket looks totally different. If you look at it, the anterior becomes superior, the superior becomes posterior. So your version has to keep changing. We say about this all the, in every presentation, sir. but this is the practical incidence. Today, we are able to quantify it. What is not talked about at all is also the soft impingement between the femoral shaft and the anterior inferior iliac spine. And when you get the femoral angles, if these things are worked up properly, this will come more and more into concentration. If you look at the last two years' publications, there are so many papers talking about the spinopelvic concentrations. Navigation, like in the knees, I think it is still not totally caught on as such. I do not know. It's a little tedious. You really need to first understand the primary non-robotic or a non-navigated hip in a three-dimensional way. If you have a vision of the three-dimensional situation, how it would look, that will help us to fine-tune this. It is not that if you have a robot, you just put in the stem and you are going to get it right. It is absolutely not. If you have not understood, you are gone. But where it will help is to do a functional positioning, what is called a functional antiversion to be given to the hip. Probably it will be added to. Already there are select centers who are exploiting this possibility pretty much well. Not to get just a cup antiversion and retroversion, but a functional antiversion and retroversion. Evaluation, execution, both the resurgence of this probably will probably change also in various many ways. So to summarize, I think no one design is way above the others. Revision seems inevitable, whatever you try at some point, it may be 10, 20, 30, but some form of a revision seems inevitable. What we probably surgeons is probably should develop is a philosophy of integrating the variables for the patient, the surgeon and the payer. Because cost is another huge factor that comes so try to integrate and what to decide what is the best we can get out of all the three. For example, the degenerated hip in the elderly do not need, does not need a durable bearing as the risk of a normal surgery using standard technology is very low. So I don't think that's so one full segment is totally out in these cases. Hence, the large diameter with a low cost bearing material is absolutely ideal. So even a metal on plastic or a ceramic or oxygen on plastic will serve us the best of both the worlds both in terms of the pricing, in terms of the stability, in terms of the mobility, and in terms of minimizing the dislocation and other issues. The integration of the variables for the patient, surgeon, and the pair again is necessary for a physiologically reactive patient. We need to consider this very seriously, relatively younger, demanding. I think it will, because the potential for great gain with the durable bearings, with the delayed revisions or a possibility of a revision, an accurate function is pretty high when you invest in these cases. So this small segment of patients probably also demand and deserve some sort of attention on these aspects. Because with suboptimal surgery in the young person, the potential for great damage is very high and the consequences are very pricey. So probably in these cases, if it is even the tariff is high, I would not consider, I would use what is probably the best in, my, in the current situation. So the, these younger patients demand certainly durable bearings precise surgery with whatever is possible within you. Which is good. One size does not fit all. I think one type does not fit all. I think we need to be playing around with this to see what is best for the patients with this. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Suri. That was a beautiful lecture. And I think everybody hearing must have enjoyed Excellent. It was very nice. Uh, Dr. Katie, do we have any questions to Dr. Suri? I think there's, there's one question for the socket orientation. Mm -hmm. uh, how exactly to avoid the antiversion or retroversion or inclination of the curve for, uh, for operative the surgeons? For operative, the first suggestion and advice would be if you are a lateral surgeon, if you are operating in the lateral position, which most of us do, Position the patient yourself for the initial times. I think you have to sock it because it all depends upon also how well you position and secure the patient in that position, the neutral, once you have that. And then use a combination of landmarks, like you said in the knee, that when you get a version, use a long axis of the trunk, the axis of the leg. And of course, on the other side is the local anatomical landmarks with transverse acetabular ligament and uh, the margins, the posterior and anterior margin. So when you do the trial socketing, if it is a very straightforward hip or a hip without any much pathology, 
I think all you need to do is use that transacetabular ligament. This is what we use constantly. So that reproduces a normal kind of a antiversion and the inclination. If there is a doubt at the, or the tal is not very obviously clear, add up with the truncal alignment of the socket along with the uh, alignment of the trunk, then you can position appropriately. If you're still not very comfortable, what I would suggest is you get the trial socket, do not put the final socket, come back, prepare the stem, then do a reduction and do your stability maneuver. And whatever is the final position, then you can do that. In that regard, if you plan to do that, prepare the stem as you go first, keep the stem in ready, then prepare the acetabulum, fix the acetabulum, then reduce the head, trial it, and you will never make a mistake. This is true good when you don't have local landmarks which are very clear. And you shoot for about 25 to 30 degree of antiversion and about 40 degree of inclination. You can be in a range. So if there is any problem at the antiversion or retroversion of the acetabulum, can it be a little bit just with the femoral antiversion or retroversion? Or no. uh, you Most have to revise, revise then and there? Most of the stems, cemented stems, you can go and probably adjust uh, to a greater extent. A non-cemented device does not give you a stem adjustability of more than about six to seven degrees. Okay. That is one. And it is very wrong to consider that if you put it in 50 degree of version, anti-version, and then you can put the stem in 30 degree of retroversion, it is not on. It's not going to work. That play of correction from one side to the other can go for about a five to six degrees. That is why I say do the trial both to the, both sides, reduce it and get it. If you are in any doubt at any point. Yeah, thank you, sir. There is one more question. Uh, sir, there is one more question from our student. Uh, yeah. Ask. Sir, Dr. Rajiv, go ahead. Uh, this question is addressed to Suri. Uh, sir, uh, what is your opinion on replacement uh, in IT fractures, and if so, what is the choice of your prosthesis? And what precautions should you take? Um, the disclaimer to this, a caveat here is intertrochantric fractures, as much as possible, you should do internal fixation, not a replacement. That is one, I think it's very, very important. Uh, brief, but at the same time, I can see that there are certain situations, very, very elderly, highly comminuted, you don't have any sort of a support on the lateral wall or the posterior side is extremely comminuted. Fixation may be in jeopardy. You could use it. In those situations in the elderly, our preference has been two things are cardinal. Get the gluteus vastus sleeve intact in one piece. And that is the one that needs to be repaired at the end, which is what is going to uh, help you to get a stable hip. And the stem of choice in these cases, since you don't have a proximal bone that is good enough, we prefer to use a short, non-cemented stem. Our preference has been a tubular stem so that you don't worry about the versional control, something like a Wagner, where you can control the antiversion in any angle you want and you can get a stability. If you are very elderly, a bipolar, if it is a, and very, very young, which is very few, extremely rare, maybe a, a, then a standard hip. But what I would want to focus in this case is the important that you maintain and preserve the gluteus vastus composite sleeve. It is like the MCL. The MCL is the force nucleus in the knee. Similarly, if, it, if you don't have a gluteus, if it sort of flies above and flies out, it's difficult. So you need to have pre placed sutures and get it back into position, then it works exceedingly well. Dr. Amit, there is a question for Dr. Rajgopal. Uh, the evolution of tibial tuberosity during surgery, sometimes when you evolve the patella, there is a version of tibial tuberosity. How to avoid and how to manage that, sir? Dr. Rajgopal. Um, so, the, the first tip is start releasing on the medial side and start externally rotating your tibia. That way you will de-stress on the tibial tubercle. And uh, most times you'll be able to get away with it. Sometimes with what happens is when you have a petala baha, which is a low-lying petala or patients who have had a previous high tibial osteotomy and there's scarring of the infrapetala fat pad. And if you find that it's difficult to evert the petala, the easiest way to get out of it is to do a rectus step. You'll never have a problem of uh, you know, compromising the petala tendon. That would be the ideal. 
if unfortunately you do evulse the uh, the patellar insertion that is a very difficult problem um one way to do it is to reattach it using drill uh, you drill a hole across the uh, tibial tubercle and use non absorbable sutures typically we would recommend using ethibon number 2 uh and it's also helpful in those situations to possibly maybe augment it with um with a semi t uh, repair that just augments it and keeps it secure because one of the uh, biggest challenges with uh, patellar tendon avulsions is they are very difficult to handle at a chronic stage so first thing is try and avoid it by externally rotating if it does happen reattach using 20 uh ethibon and use a sleeve of uh, semi t to augment it just to give you additional stability those would be the three in that order thank you sir thank you another question for dr uh, suri uh, metal or metal like resurfacing that is uh, uh, still working with the bhr uh, how not for the other uh, make like uh, johnson and jimmer they all failed but bhr is still working resurfacing what happened to all these it was a design issue they were they were they were, were hemispherical the diametric clearances and the fluid film duplication they got it right basically that's why the other reason once failed basically because of technical issues so it was a design issue that failed the other two so that's why bhr is a good has a good long history with this case. also the one from the ucla that also works equally well has shown law good long term results with regard that is with regard to the materials but with regard to the performance we discussed it's a very select way the right choice women it's a no no today it is rarely you do small size heads it's a no no if you have something like a pistol grip uh, hip which is a dysplasia you don't do it anymore if you are doing it in a soft bone with the cystic changes you don't like to do it so i think we are very restricted indications probably 10 15% maybe choice you uh, maybe useful but again like i said unless they are very high performance required requirements for those patients i think you can select well a standard good hard on hard bearing or probably hard on soft i think they will be equally good results but like i said if you are looking at uh, working with the uh, or going back to some high level sport then i think this stuff is the way to go another question came from the uh, youtube i think already you answered that that the intra op if you cement the cup in little red to version can you get away by version adjustment in the simple stem already answered but again you can just... i would not accept any retro version to start with this retro version patients any some degree of less anti version is okay but no retro version okay i would suggest that they change it then and then don't consider and expect the retroward uh, and overting uh, the socket stem to compensate for this it's not a very advisable idea because if if you say two tomorrow it will be 3 degree accepting 4 degree ac accepting so i think as a youngster starting no retroversion i think would be an appropriate answer to them uh there is one more question for rajgopal uh, if time permits Yeah, go ahead, sir. Um, one of my student wants to know from Dr. Raj Gopal, uh, which referencing does he prefer and why? Anterior referencing and posterior referencing in a knee joint, in a primary knee. Uh, Rajiv, always, always anterior, always anterior. The 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 simple reason for that is with. complex deformities so if you're looking at a severe varus deformity there is a posterior medial uh, defect on the tibia there is a compensatory overgrowth on the posterior medial uh, condyle of the femur and if you use posterior referencing instrumentation you're going to internally rotate the uh, your femoral orientation you'll do the exact opposite on the lateral side because there is overgrowth on the lateral side on the posterior lateral side so it makes it a lot easier for us to just orient yourself from an anterior so we always 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 uh, reference anteriorly yeah thanks that is a very good uh, information they want they wanted to hear from you
Hello, I think this should be the last question. There is one more question that if there is a mismatch between the friction gap, gap and extension gap, Dr. Raj Gopal sir, so how to manage it? So, uh, so the algorithm here is if your flexion gap is bigger, you upsize your femur, you increase your femur either by using a larger size or by using posterior augments. Uh, that will reduce your flexion gap and you'll be able to balance. Uh, if your extension gap is too much, you would distalize your femur. So you would use distal augments and get your femoral component a little further distal and you can get up to about 14 millimeters. I think the largest distal augment is between 14 and 15 depending on what uh, situation you're using. So you either distalize the femur if there's an ex increased extension gap, if there's a flexion gap which is too big, you posteriorize the femur either by posterior augments or upsizing. And sometimes you'll get the situation where your flexion gap is so big, there's no way you can upsize it. Those would be a classical indication for a rotating hinge. That would be the single most uh, critical uh, indication for a hinge. One more question, sir. The sequence of release, release in the uh, valgus knee. Okay, so yeah. so you start anteriorly, start with the uh, anterior attachment of the iliotubal band, release it up to the girdis tubercle, go past, you go past the, the popliteus tendon, and then you get to the posterolateral corner, and at that point, you distract the, the, the joint, and you do pie crusting of the posterolateral capsules. And the way I do it is with a number 11 blade, just multiple drill, multiple sort of punctures. And then you put in your trial and you pop whatever uh, stab incisions are done. Usually stab incisions will become like a continuous incision. There'll be a distraction of about two to three millimeters. Uh, Sometimes in spite of doing that, you'll still find that it's not balanced, in which case you have to pie crust the iliotibial band and that will give you your release. And of course, you know, if, if the deformity is very severe, you'd obviously take down the PCL. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any more questions from the uh, attendees? Uh, one personal question can I ask, sir? Yes, sir, go ahead. Uh, Raj Gopal, we had a patient who had undergone a TKR. Her knee became completely stiff. It was done by elsewhere. Then she went to a second orthopedic surgeon and he did an arthroscopic uh, sort of uh, adhesion lysis or whatever. Even then her knee is completely stiff and now she has come to me. She is about 65, 70. What do I do for her? Um. Her knee is completely stiff. That depends whether you want me to answer that as a friend or... Uh... <laughs> no, 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 no. She, she's come to me with a great belief that... Okay. Okay, here. So, so, so you tell me what I should do, then I will do it. Yeah. So, the, the, so the first thing is arthroscopy has no role in total knee replacement. That's, a, that's the first <laughs> lesson to be learned from here. There's got absolutely no, no role for, uh, for, for arthroscopic intervention. I think you should do a CT scan. My guess is that the rotation is wrong, either on the femur or on the tibia. Uh, this is a patient with arthrofibrosis. So I would go in, I would, or the, the component size is wrong. I would go in, I would do this completely like a revision situation, get your rotation right, remove all the material, remove all the scar tissue, recreate the gutters, particularly recreate the posterior recess of the femur and the posterior capsule on both sides, on the femoral side. Um, get your sizing right, get your rotation right. Um, this is one patient where I would definitely use a rectus snip and uh, make sure your orientation of the petala is right in the petalar groove. Start mobilization within four hours of the surgery, either by a CPM or by a good physiotherapist. Put her in a dialogue brace. First uh, 10 to 15 days, up to 45 to 60 degrees. Uh, 15 to 28 days uh, between 
45-60 to 80-85 and warn her that her range of flexion at the end of her recovery period will not be more than 85, 90, 95, 100 degrees. That's a functional range and you'd have done very well. And if it is a patella that has been resurfaced, remove the patella button, do a patella plasty. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, will, I will look into these points. Thank you, sir. Uh, question to both Dr. Ashokraj Gopal and Dr. Uh, Surinarayan. Sir, both of you are doing a lot of uh, joint surgeries and your audience all over the country from Ortho TV, they're young surgeons. Uh, how to get the fellowship uh, at your centers and uh, how long is the waiting list and uh, what is the way I have to... The message to the young surgeons, uh, residents and the PGs, sir. One by one. Dr. Ashok, then Dr. Sur. Um, so all they have to do is to just reach out and write to us uh, on my email. Uh, at the moment, as you might imagine, we, we have not had a fellow for the past almost 12 months. And the guy who was do, working with us, unfortunately, had to leave because surgery is shut down. So at the moment, we have a wait of about 18 months. Uh, but please ask them to write and we will certainly uh, you know, accommodate them because we're not planning to have shorter fellowships and have more people enrolled because we have a fair amount of a backlog at the moment, which we'd like to try and clear. So assuming that we start off full throttle by about March of next year, please ask them to write to us and we'll certainly consider that. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Dr. Suri, sir. Yeah, I was, I think we run a three-month fellowships, which is uh, rotates. Uh, the three-month fellowships, I think they can directly write to us. Uh, like Ashok said, the same thing, the problem we are facing at this point is the weight is you know, for another year, year in the water, I think. Most welcome to come, but if they would just like to come for a month as a short term, as such, they are welcome. One, We can take one at a time in those cases. But parallelly, we have the other one, which is from the South Indian Arthroplasty Associates. It's a two-year fellowship, totally arthroplasty. They rotate through four cities. That is uh, both the Ganga in uh, Hyderabad, Bangalore, and Chennai. Six months each. That is a funded fellowship. And uh, the only thing is probably best suited for the fellows who are still bachelors, probably other they have to keep on shifting in the city every six months and their wives will be on their neck. Uh, but if that is not the case, I think they have to apply. That goes through an interview once a year we conduct. They can put, I can just probably forward you the address, the central offices in Bangalore. So they can put in their application. It's a, vir a virtual interview they take. And four of them are selected to rotate through all the four cities every year. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. You both are the two pillars of... Yeah, most, yeah. Like, most welcome to email to us. That is a direct access, not a problem. Thank you so much, sir. You both are the two pillars of joint replacement from the two parts of the country. And uh, you are the pioneer and you have brought the joint replacement in this country. And uh, this is the proud moment for all the young surgeons that uh, you, you may be the teacher of all these young surgeons. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, Dr. Manishi, just... Uh, uh, conclude the session and give thanks to all. Any other question from any panelists, please? Uh, just, a, just a note, I want to thank uh, thank the Allahabad Orthopedic Association and uh, Dr. Tripathi uh, and all the, all the friends uh, on the screen. Thank you. It's been a wonderful uh, time that we've had and uh, thank you for your uh, very kind invitation. It's been wonderful to be with all of you. Thank you, sir. So it's really a matter of great pride and privilege for Allahabad Orthoboard Society to have a uh, wisdom of two doyans of the orthoplasty, uh, Dr. Raj Gopal and Professor Suri. Uh, definitely, sir, we have learned a lot and we learned what not to do that is more important rather than what to do. And both of you have explained in such a nice manner that what should not be done and how we can remove our shortcomings so that we can become a better surgeon, sir. Definitely, sir, your wisdom helps out a lot. And hopefully, we will meet in the future also and take your wisdom again, sir. Thank you a lot. And I also thank Dr. Rajiv Nayak and Dr. Rastogi for spending their valuable time and chairing the session. And all the delegates who took participate in the this Ortho TV session. And all, I would also thank uh, Ortho TV session, Mr. Dr. Neeraj Jilani, who managed all these things, and the McLeod people who conduct, uh, helped in managing the show. Thank you, sir. Thank you from the Labad Auto Society. Thank you. Particularly, Dr. Mr. Rajiv Tripathi. Rajiv, are you there? 
sir, I'm there. Uh, sir, one thing because I am not from your fraternity, but yes, we are there. I got mesmerized with the talks that uh, Dr. Ashok Rajkumar did and uh, Dr. Surya Narayan. Oh my God, they are such good orators. I mean, I have fallen in love with them, sir. <laughs> they, <laughs> they are so. I have fallen in love. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, Actually, yeah. I tell you, sir. I could, I yeah. could hardly understand. what was being discussed but what i could guess is the kind of teachers they are oh my god their students are so blessed you know i mean oh i mean i have only one thing to say india is proud of you sir dr rajiv dr surya narayan dr kd dr mirish all i mean oh my god sir uh, mcloyd is proud that we have shared the platform with you thank you so much for giving us opportunity to share it with you thank you so much and you know sir only one thing i would conclude with request for bi d3 max and enzo max <laughs> <laughs> thank, you, thank, you, thank, thank you sir thank you sir thank you dr rajkumar sir thank you dr rajiv nayak sir thank you very much thank you sir thank you sir thank you thank you sir thank you thank you sir thank you sir thank you bansal sir next time when i come i will meet you in allahabad sure sir it will be my pleasure sir Uh, you all are you all are invited after uh, i think the uh, corona yeah. you all yes, are invited yes. to go to payagraj we will make a one a good joint replacement uh, uh, conference 